All right, this lecture is about the Hebrews and ancient Judaism. Let's talk about this here for a minute. A little bit of background. The uh, first thing you have to understand is overall, the Hebrews were very insignificant people. Uh, they didn't conquer large territories like people in China or India. Uh, they never dominated regions they lived in, either politically or militarily. But they still have a very important role in shaping the beliefs of many of the world's people today. Um, pretty much every corner of our society has been touched in some way by the Hebrews. Now, some of this is true history. Some of this is more of a religious focus. And whenever you talk about religion, it, it can be a touchy sense sensitive point, so my goal is not to offend anybody, and if I do, I'm uh, very sorry. But um, I'm going to try to look at this from a, a historical point of view. Um, first of all, the patriarch of the Hebrews is Abraham, and he probably left Sumeria sometime between 1900 and 1500 BC, and he migrated into what is today southern Syria. Now, once he gets there, he's going to make a covenant with a god he named Yahweh. And this god is going to operate in the world of righteousness, basically. Before that time, the Hebrews were probably polytheists, just like everybody else in the area. And he, Abraham is going to see that the Hebrew people are appointed by Yahweh to read his message to other people of the world. And the Hebrews are going to remain somewhat separate from everybody else uh, simply because they want to maintain a purity in their faith and they want to spread this message of Yahweh. Now those who choose to follow Yahweh uh, they show this by being circumcised. And eventually, the Hebrews are going to become known as the Israelites, and they get that name from Abraham's grandson before they moved to Egypt. And we also have the story of Moses in Egypt. According to tradition, uh, the Israelites, as they're now called, moved to Egypt, and they lived there for about three centuries. And they are enslaved during the New Kingdom. Now, sometime around 1250 BC, Moses becomes the leader of the Israelites and is going to lead the people out of Egypt into the Sinai Desert. And this is what's known as the Exodus. During the time in the Sinai Desert, Moses receives the law of God with covenant of the Ten Commandments. And Moses persuades the Hebrews to accept Yahweh as their one God, pointing out that he had been the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's where Yahweh officially becomes the God of the Israelites. Now, the commandments that Yahweh gave Moses, uh, they lay out the basic beliefs of the Jewish ethical system. Uh, the first four commandments, they deal with human obligations to Yahweh or God and how they were to worship him, while the other six, they deal with relationships between people, honor thy mother, honor thy father, etc., etc. And it's during this period that the Hebrews practice what is called as mono, ah, I never say this word, mono luxury. Um, basically what that is, is the exclusive worship of one God while still not denying the existence of others. So there's a difference between monotheistic, where uh, you are, there's only one God, nobody else exists, versus monolatry, where uh, you say one God is supreme, but you don't necessarily say the others aren't real. So this is a period where the soon to be Jewish faith is transitioning into monotheism. 
for it, or you can always just support God. Now, this isn't the first instance of monotheism. There is a lesser known religion called Zoroastrianism to become monotheistic. It is the largest one. Now, if you've never heard of Zoroastrianism, just to give you a, a real quick breakdown on that, uh, there was this person named Zoroaster who has a revelation at the age of 30. He's visited by these archangels, and it becomes Zoroaster's job to teach the moral law of Ahura Mazda. And there are actually very many similarities between Zoroastrianism and Hebrewism or Judaism. But moving on from there, um, the way that Yahweh was seen by the Hebrews was different than what Zoroastrians think of Zoroaster and Ahura Mazda. For one thing, um, according to the Jewish faith, um, God and nature are separate. Many other religions saw their gods as representing nature, but in Judaism, um, Yahweh is seen as being above and superior to nature, and he also gave his human subjects domain over much of the natural world to use for their purposes. So, Yahweh gives people the ability to change the environment, while in many other religions, the environment changes because of the God. Another thing that made Judaism unique was that the Hebrews or the Israelites saw Yahweh as a moral being. Uh, Egyptians, Mesopotamians, even the Romans, they saw their gods as being amoral and capricious. They meddled in human affairs for their own entertainment. If you will. Uh, Yahweh demanded ethical behavior and let his believers know what was expected of him. And Judaism also differed in the way it looked at the separation between the material world and the spiritual world. The human body and human spirit are seen as part of a whole on the earth. And then... Um, after death, the human spirit goes elsewhere to be with Yahweh. Uh, the Hebrew religion is also seen different in the fact that Yahweh was a God who cared and took part in the affairs of humans instead of being indifferent to humans, except for when the appropriate sacrifices were done. Now, to understand what Yahweh wanted them to do, the Hebrews turned to the Torah. The, which are the first five books of the Old Testament, or the Pentateuch. And this consists of the, the books Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, that's the Torah in Judaism, or the first five books of the Old Testament, if you are someone who follows Christianity. Now, the Torah is going to provide the laws and regulations that would be used to govern Jewish religion and Jewish society. And it stated that if the Hebrews followed those guidelines, then they would have the drink of Yahweh. Now, within the Torah, you find the history, the laws, the poetry, the culture, and you might, if you are somebody who has read the Old Testament, you might see so-and-so, son of so-and-so, son of person. Uh, all of that is to keep their ancestry alive as well. Now, the Torah was written down in its current form somewhere around 1300 BC, and it was based on oral tradition. Now, there is a second book in Judaism called the Talmud. Now, the Talmud is a newer document. It was written somewhere between 4 and 500 uh, CE or AD, depending on how you, uh, you look at it. And that's based on the instructions used by the rabbi. Uh, rabbi means teacher in Hebrew, 
And the Talmud is going to be the teachings of the rabbis and how to interpret the Torah based on the teachings of the rabbis. And the Talmud comes in two different parts. There's the Mishnah, which are the oral traditions, and then the Gemara, which is the analysis of the Torah written down by rabbis. When you put both of those together, that's going to give the Hebrews the guidance they need to keep in the good graces of Yahweh. Now what happens to the Israelites? Um, following the division of Israel into two parts, uh, one, one the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel, uh, the Hebrews decline, the Israel, Israelites start to decline. Uh, around 720 BC, the kingdom of Israel is destroyed by the Assyrians. And somewhere around 585 BC, the Neo-Babylonians, or the New Babylonians, if you will, from the previous lecture, they're going to defeat the king of Judah and destroy the Temple of Solomon located in Jerusalem. And that becomes known as the period of Babylonian captivity. Now, the period of time the Hebrews are out of the area, um, it's about 50 years long where the Hebrew people are taken to the kingdom of Babylon. But it's in that time that you can almost say that Judaism is purified. Uh, the Hebrews or the Israelites, they resolve to keep their cultural values and their cultural ways. So holy days, circumcision, memorizing the Torah, all of that is solidified in stone. <clears throat> the Persian king Cyrus the Great is going to conquer Babylon and allow the Israelites to return to Jerusalem. But when they get there, it's found that Jerusalem is destroyed the only part of Solomon's temple that is remaining is the Wailing Wall, which is a holy site in many religions today. All right, so that's a very, very short lecture on the Hebrews. Now let me pull over our syllabus here. We are on week two, so we have Discussion three, discussion four, quiz three, and quiz four, and then reflection paper number one. Now, just to remind you about the reflection papers. The drop box for the reflection paper is right here where it says reflection paper drop boxes. And it has to be turned in before next Monday, the 14th of June at 11.59 p.m. Now, what can you use for your reflection paper? You can use any of the readings from week one, week two, week three, or week four. Sorry. Let me correct myself. Week one or week two. Sorry, I'm thinking of a regular semester. So you can use any of the readings from prehistory in Mesopotamia or any of the readings from Egypt in the Hebrews. So just for example, I've clicked on lesson three online readings. Let's say that you read the ancient Egyptian book of the dead. The point of the reflection paper is to give me your opinion on that reading. Do you like it? Do you dislike it? Why do you like it? Why do you not like it? And then support your opinion. Explain to me what the article made you think of, how you felt reading it, and convince me, show me why you feel as you do about your chosen article. Uh, maybe you really, really liked reading about um, Gilgamesh. What'd you think of the story? Is the story believable? Do you have a problem with the story, etc., etc.? And the whole point of these reflection papers is to get you thinking critically about a subject, getting your thoughts on paper, and teaching you and showing you it is okay to have an opinion and to voice that opinion. Uh, that will be very useful to you when you get into the, the employment world or 
if you choose to go on and get a four-year degree. So I promise there's a method behind the madness, and I encourage you all to do the best you can on it. Uh, how do you do well on it? Page and a half to two pages, double space it. Make the first paragraph the quick summary of the article and make the rest of it your thoughts, your opinions. So just one paragraph of summary and then a page to a page and a half of how you feel about the article. And convince me, show me why you feel as you do. Okay, that's it for this. Any questions, concerns, comments, please email. I will answer. Uh, if you're in Carrollton and want to stop by my office, please do so and let me know how I can help. We'll talk to you soon.